Hey everyone, I think we will get started. Please um, continue to mute yourself throughout the meeting. Um, and if you have any questions, you can um, send them in the chat and we will address them um, at the end of the, of the session. So, welcome. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. My name is Kate McAuley, and I am the executive director of the Women's Ordination Conference. The Women's Ordination Conference is a grassroots driven movement that promotes activism, dialogue, and prayerful witness to call for women's ordination and gender equity in the Roman Catholic Church. Our voice and our witness at the Commission on the Status of Women meetings is one of faithful challenge to the institutional church. We speak as Catholic women and believe that the church is an important moral voice in the world. We share Pope Francis's messages of synodality, interconnectivity, dialogue, and co-responsibility. And we pray for our common home, as well as our church, as places where these values are not yet fully realized. The Catholic Church recognizes climate change as a moral issue that threatens creation and impacts the world's most vulnerable. However, it should be no surprise that because the institutional church is a patriarchy, it fails to protect, celebrate, and learn from those who are disproportionately at risk, namely women, women of color, indigenous women, and those in poverty. Yet in spite of their vulnerability, we know that women are not simply victims. Their leadership, moral agency, and wisdom have been and continue to be essential to charting creative solutions to the complex factors threatening the environment and the church. This year, the priority theme is a bit outside of our usual wheelhouse, but it is inherently connected to our work to dismantle systems of oppression in all forms and call our faith leaders to account in modeling gender equality. Climate justice is gender justice. And the institutional church in its commitment to addressing climate change and living out the gospel must center the experiences and leadership of women. Integral ecology has long been the study of feminist, womanist, and queer theologians. However, we fear that the lack of women's scholarship, leadership, and wisdom, particularly around this issue, not only suggests that we have work to do, but it puts women, communities, and the environment at risk. I will also add that the church, along with the environmental movement, which we'll hear more about at this session, itself are complicit in the sins of sexism, patriarchy, racism, and white supremacy, which only, only further entrench these injustices. So today, we hope that this conversation is part of that much needed remedy. This session aims to examine the institutional Catholic Church's past and present approaches to the climate crisis, the far-reaching systems of oppression that are at work, the long-term effects of continuing as we have as a church and society, and what wisdom we can draw from eco-womanist, eco-feminist, indigenous, queer, and Latinx thinkers, activists, and movements. We have five esteemed theologians, thinkers, and experts with us today, and I'd like to start by introducing our moderator, Stephanie Clary, who will facilitate this conversation and introduce our other speakers. And just another note before we begin, please keep yourself muted as to not distract the speakers. Um, and you may submit your questions anytime uh, in the chat and we will take those up at the end of the session. So let us begin. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephanie Clary, who is the environment editor at Earthbeat, a project of the National Catholic Reporter that publishes stories about climate crises, faith and action. Formerly, Stephanie served as a digital editor at US Catholic. She holds a master's degree in systematic theology from Catholic Un Theological Union in Chicago, where her research focused on eco-feminist theology and film. And prior to her roles in national Catholic journalism, Stephanie helped coordinate the implementation of Laudato Si in the Roman Catholic Diocese of Burlington, Vermont. Thank you, Kate. And thank you to the Women's Ordination Conference for hosting this important conversation today on such a critical issue and for providing a space for our esteemed panelists to share their expertise and experiences with us. I'm really looking forward to hearing what the women on our panel have to share with us today. So I'll just offer some brief bios um, on each of them before we begin, and then we'll be able to jump into the conversation and let the discussion flow freely. As Kate mentioned, if you have questions, please send them over in the chat um, and we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. 
So we are excited to have with us today, Amanda Baugh, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at California State University, Northridge. She specializes in religion and the environment with particular attention to race, ethnicity, and class. Her published works seek to decenter religious environmentalism. And in her current project, she demonstrates how Spanish speaking Catholics in the United States participate in their own distinct environmental traditions that combine Catholic sensibilities with nostalgic memories and cultural values grounded in Latin America. Sharon Bong is Associate Professor of Gender Studies at the School of Arts and Social Sciences at Monash University, Malaysia. Her research expertise is the intersection of genders, sexualities, and religions, including feminist and queer theologies. Her translational research harnesses the academia industry linkage, which she has sustained through involvement in various theological and social forums. And in 2018, she facilitated gender and development awareness training for stakeholders for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees Malaysia and the UNHCR staff and partners to better operationalize their policy on age gender diversity mainstreaming. Teresia Hinga is Associate Professor at Santa Clara University. Born in Kenya, she received degrees from Kenyatta University and Nairobi University before completing her PhD in Religious Studies and African, African Christianity from the University of Lancaster in England. Her research focuses on religion and women's issues, particularly in Africa, African religious history and expression in the global religious landscape, religion and public policy and the ethics of globalization. And Chanel Robinson is a doctoral candidate in systematic theology at Boston College. Her scholarship explores womanist theology and theological anthropology. An educator and a scholar, Chanel completed a Master of Arts in Theological Studies and a Master of Teaching at the University of Toronto. She is the recipient of doctoral fellowships through the Social Science and Humanities Research Council and the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. So thank you, Amanda, Sharon, Teresia, and Chanel for being here with us today. I'd like to start our conversation by asking Sharon if you could situate us in the Catholic context on climate and gender issues from a historical and doctrinal perspective. So in terms of creation theology and anthropology, what worldview has the Catholic Church typically promoted? And are there shortcomings to that framework, particularly as it understands gender and sexuality? Um, thank you so much for that question, uh, Stephanie. I'd like to begin firstly by thanking uh, Kate for inviting me. And um, I feel honored to be part of uh, this very important conversation. And this is a current research of mine working on the intersection of uh, climate justice and gender justice. So it was an invitation that was uh, difficult to turn down. And I, I hope uh, to be lucid for for you know, most part of uh, this, this afternoon for you, it's midnight for me. So in response to um, Stephanie's question, uh, the Catholic Church's um, theology of creation or creation theology uh, promotes an anthropocentric worldview. And I think all of us who are gathered here, right, and no doubt of that, and that is the domination of man over nature or human over nature. And in the uh, Pope's green encyclical, Laudato Si, anthropocentrism is positioned as a principle of universality within a Christian framework. And the Pope uh, predictably draws from biblical anthropocentrism, which renders the human as imago Dei, created out of love and made in God's image and likeness. So in that regard, the human being is conferred an infinite dignity because the human alone is created in God's image and likeness. And given the uniqueness of human beings' capacity to reason, they are further distinguished from other species, notably animals. So the human person is therefore ontologically superior in relation to other species in creation. And from Laudato Si, um, paragraph 119, Christian thought that sees human beings as possessing a particular dignity above other creatures. And that is why experimentation on animals is permitted, because whilst it does entail suffering on the part of animals, it doesn't entail the needless suffering of animals. So Laudato Si makes that distinction 
And so that's why to experiment on animals for humans' benefit is morally acceptable when it contributes to caring for or saving human lives. Of course, from the church's position, what is not defensible is scientific experimentation on living human embryos. What is problematic about this anthropocentric worldview is that it also leads to a mechanistic worldview, aside from the fact that it you know, renders hierarchical um, ordering to um, all creation. It also leads to this uh, mechanistic worldview that regards creation as created for the use of humankind. Um, and where we were once given the mandate to have dominion over the earth, to subdue nature as an insensate order, uh, human beings are now called to practice responsible stewardship, given the you know, ecological um, devastation that we see before us. And this entails a duty of care that embodies a universal communion. So my question is, is this too little and too late? Um, our insensate drive towards progress and development has led to what the Pope labels a tyrannical anthropocentrism and a distorted anthropocentrism. But yet, despite all of this, you know, um, human-centered creation is still insisted upon despite its excesses. And for those of us who um, embrace biocentrism, animal rights in all its various degrees, uh, the Pope has a label for that, and that is a misguided anthropocentrism. So that is um, what I find problematic about um, that positioning. Thanks. Thank you. And so you, you mentioned a bit uh, towards the end of your answer there that this way of viewing the world as a series of hierarchical dichotomies with this hierarchical order with humans at the top isn't the only understanding at play though. And it's arguably not even the only understanding we can glean from Catholic teachings about creation, though it has been the one historically promoted and institutionally promoted. There are other frameworks that are probably more accurate from a scientific standpoint and more in line with the concept of integral ecology that Pope Francis always talks about and that he uses uh, that term in Laudato Si. Um, so Chanel, can you share with us some alternative ways of understanding and being in the world and why they might better support women and other marginalized groups in the church? Sure, thank you for your question, Stephanie. And I also want to express my thanks to Kate and to the Women's Ordination Conference for inviting me to participate in this panel and gratitude towards my fellow panelists. I appreciate this opportunity to learn with you. Um, I wanna begin by fleshing out what Pope Francis is inviting us to meditate on in this encyclical. So in his groundbreaking 2015 letter, Laudato Si, the Pope invites us to rethink how humanity is inextricable connected with the earth. He articulates an integral ecology that situates a concern for the environment within the scope of Catholic social teaching. Throughout the letter addressed to all of humanity, Pope Francis reminds us of how marginalized communities, especially the poor, experience disenfranchisement alongside the earth. By integral ecology, he is referring to how all living and non-living inhabitants of the planet are intermeshed and interwoven. It is a concept that has social and cultural elements with a focus on our collective responsibility to ensure a livable place for future generations to come. Hierarchical dichotomies of sexism and racism are inherently incompatible with a worldview informed by integral ecology. When we ignore the demands of this type of ecological focus, we hasten the premature death of black and brown and indigenous communities and women all around the world. Additionally, theological approaches like eco-womanism, which we've mentioned before, also kind of allow us to think about the contiguity between the oppression of the most marginalized communities and the subjugation of the earth together. 
the Catholic tradition, I think when we think through it and look at the writings of women, we find resources for reinterpreting humanity's relationship with the world. And so I want to take us back in time a little bit to the 12th century where Hildegard of Bingen, who's a 12th century mystic and visionary, offers this really rich understanding of how we can understand humanity's relationship with the entire earth. There's an ecological focus that's interwoven throughout her entire corpus. Her emphasis on veriditas provides a theological language that is necessary for describing our interrelationality. Veriditas refers to this greening energy that infuses and sustains all human and non-human life. And so humanity within this scope cannot understand itself apart from the earth. That's beautiful, thank you. Um, Sharon, did you have anything you wanted to add from your work um, working with queer theologies or other uh, models of looking at the world? Uh, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for your response also earlier, Chanel. Um, I'll reserve comment on the uh, queer ecofeminist um, theologies that I'm uh, recently worked on, but perhaps add to, to um, the point uh, to my response earlier, what is problematic about an androcentric um, uh, worldview of uh, the church's uh, creation theology is that it is it is also a deeply um, uh, androcentric one, and uh, that is it promotes domination of men over women. And although Laudato Si is largely gender neutral or gender blind, and that in itself is also problematic. Uh, there are disappointingly no references to, you know, ecofeminist theologians like Rosemary Radford Ruther from the Catholic tradition and many others, including Asian ecofeminist um, theologians. So I, you know, readily turn to the work of um, theologians from the Ecclesia of Women in Asia. This is an academic forum of Asian Catholic feminist women uh, that I am a part of and have been since uh, 2004. So Pushpa Joseph, for instance, uh, Sister Pushpa Joseph from India, she reclaims the erotic that is embedded in the feminine uh, principle of uh, Sakti, and she draws from tantric uh, philosophy. So Shakti is the creative energy inherent in and uh, proceeds from God. And it is exemplified by the female principle, the female reproductive organs, or the goddess Shakti, who is the wife of Shiva. So what uh, Pushpa has done is she has integrated um, elements from uh, Hinduism with uh, Catholic um, theology. And so a, a Shakti theology that is centered on this feminine principle of creation is constructed on women's experiences that are intersected by the variables of caste, class, gender, ethnicity, and will be empowering, embodied, agapic, context sensitive, and life generating. And it has consciousness raising and transformation at the school. So I find um, turning to, you know, ecofeminist theologies like this so much more um, life sustaining because of the uh, absence or the gap of um, a gendered lens, let alone a feminist lens in, in you know, green encyclicals like uh, La Dato Si. Thank you. Um, those are two really powerful examples of historical women who bring a different view to this conversation of creation and anthropology. Um, Teresia and Amanda, did either of you want to share examples from your areas of work um, that reflect this uh, uh, something that is not anthropocentric or androcentric um, and how that's being lived out or proclaimed? I mean, I'll get it into this a little bit more when it's when it's my formal turn, but just there's there's a very strong sense of kinship and um, family centeredness in, in a lot of what I'm hearing from my um, Spanish speaking interlocutors. Um, so discussions of nature have to do with being more agricultural as opposed to leisure landscapes, um, but being being on the farm with grandpa or, you know, so it's about a, a lot of I would say a lot more family centered. Yes, uh, I would agree uh, with Amanda and uh, Chanel and, and Sharon 
that there are alternative ways of thinking about the world and being in the world. I happen to be a, a Kikuyu, I'm a Christian, but I'm also a Kikuyu. That's one of the 40 or so indigenous uh, communities in Kenya. And our worldview is that alternative worldview that is more integral. Uh, the, the, when they read the Laudato Si, they will be like, duh, we've been, done, we've been there, done that. Uh, there's uh, trees, for example, uh, are sacred. Mountains are sacred. Uh, Mount Kenya is a, a sacred mountain. We worship facing Mount Kenya and for which we were accused of nature worship and forbidden and told it to go to confession for idolatry. And so uh, I'll be commenting uh, later on, on on that alternative uh, worldview and how it's coming through in modern times through some of the uh, lead, leading women who are pushing not just for equality for women, but ecofeminism. And you give examples of that. So thank you, Sharon, for bringing uh, forward um, uh, these thoughts of alternatives to anthropocentrism. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, those are all really wonderful examples. And I think we can all hear in those that outside of the institutional church, though, Hildegard of Bingen might be like getting close. At least we, she's a, a saint and uh, recently named a doctor of the church, but mostly outside of the institutional church, um, we do have many people of faith, often women, uh, the women and the examples that you've all given, um, and also many unfamous women that we will never know their names, have been and continue to live in ways that embody these more relational um, kinship, as Amanda said, respectful understandings of creation. And though they don't always label it as sustainable or eco-friendly or even care for creation, um, people are living in these ways. So Amanda, maybe you could share from your work um, with Spanish speaking Catholics in the US, what is motivating those lifestyles uh, if it isn't a desire to kind of go green in the, the trendier pop popular sense? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, first I wanna thank Kate and the um, Women's Ordination Conference for this opportunity and this great conversation and my panelists and Stephanie, thanks for setting up all of our questions. It's, it's, it's exciting to be part of this. Um, and, and before I talk about um, the women and men that I've been speaking with in Los Angeles, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how kind of a dominant interpretation of Laudato Si because that sets up a contrast um, for, for what I'm hearing among my interlocutors. Um, and so regardless of, what Laudato Si actually says, and we've heard already panelists putting it into very, very strong Catholic context. Um, a lot of popular responses and media responses in the United States and dominant conversations have basically interpreted the encyclical as a clear endorsement of the environmental movement. Um, so media outlets were calling it a game changer, an environmental manifesto. Um, one Jesuit priest on NPR said that Laudato Si would encourage Catholics to make changes in what they consume and how they live their daily lives. And the problem with this interpretation of Laudato Si equals environmentalism is that Laudato Si, I bet environmentalism is a distinct uh, political and social movement with its own history that's dominated by particular people, politically progressive white people, both Catholic and not, um, and it's shaped through a white racial frame. By white racial frame, I'm talking about a worldview that interprets everything through the lens of white experience. Um, and I'm drawing from my colleague, Chris Carter, who's at um, USD, who does great stuff on nature and race and religion. Um, so thinking about the white racial frame in the context of Laudato Si, ideas of what it means to respond to the encyclical, or you'll see lots of things, oh, here's how you live Laudato Si. Those often assume that the people responding or living Laudato Si are affluent and white. So when you get tip sheets on living Laudato Si, um, you know, here in, L and in Los Angeles, they really like to promote solar panels, solar panels. How can we get everybody solar panels? Let's fly less. Uh, or when the priests, you know, said on NPR that the encyclical would encourage Catholics to make major changes in how they consume and live their lives. He's assuming that, um, you know, he's reading it through a white racial frame, assuming that all Catholics need to make these major changes in how they consume. 
And, and that message is just not relevant for, for many of the Spanish speaking Catholics that I've met across Los Angeles who already live in dense urban housing by necessity, right? Uh, they already take public transit. Um, they're already you know, conserving energy to keep the bills low and they're gardening in the backyard. They're eating organic local food from their own backyard. Um, what I found particularly, so I, I conducted ethnographic research for about five years after the release of Laudato Si, and particularly among bilingual young adults, so the sons and daughters of um, Spanish-speaking immigrants, they talked about the environment in two distinct frames, depending on the context of our conversation. When they talked about the environment in Laudato Si, they really talked about it using a white racial frame. We need to repair our damaged ecological relationships, there's this huge, huge crisis that we have on our hands and I'm guilty and it's, it's almost debilitating. Like the problems are so big, what can I do about it? And then the solutions that they've received from, you know, talking about La Dr. CR, stop using styrofoam and recycle more. So the problems are huge and the way to respond are these just kind of small incrementalist individual uh, measures. But when they start talking more, they say, well, but you know what, actually we've been doing these things our whole lives and it wasn't because of La Dr. C. We've been doing these things um, because, because of inherited values of conservation, love, and respect from their families, and especially grandmothers and mothers. Um, so what I'm, I've been calling these inherited environmental practices abuelita environmentalism or grandmother environmentalism, uh, drawing from the concept of abuelita theology. That's a framework that insists on the value of women's lived experience in the spaces of everyday life as sources for liberative theology. So scholars of Latinx religion and Mujerista theologians have talked about a matriarchal core in, in Latinx popular religiosity so that women, especially mothers and grandmothers, are the gatekeepers of home and community-based religious traditions. And through my research, I found that this extends to environmental behaviors, that, that mothers and grandmothers um, are responsible for inculcating um, sustainable behaviors among children and young adults. So some examples, across Los Angeles time and again, I've heard about these stories of environmental values inherited from grandmothers and mothers. Um, tons of people have told me how absurd it is to purchase Tupperware. We don't, why would we purchase Tupperware when we can just reuse these old containers? And I learned from my students at Cal State Northridge, there's actually a meme depicting this widespread practice. It's a picture of um, green salsa inside a container if I can't believe it's not butter. And it says, of course it's not butter, it's salsa. So this kind of widespread practice, why would I buy something? Um, fruit trees, I know um, Teresia talked about trees being so important in, in the communities you're studying. Everybody that I've talked to in Los Angeles talks about trees, trees, fruit trees in our yard, you know, and, and we're not talking about people with giant yards, but there's tons of fruit trees. And some pers one person even told me, it's like, if you're Latino and you don't have a fruit tree in your yard, you're not really Latino. Um, I have some young women who I'm calling Rebecca and Elena. Their mother taught them to respect agricultural workers and all the material goods that they have, um, mostly through her long drawn out prayers. So especially they said at Thanksgiving, the prayers are like 10 minutes long because we start by talking about the campesinos who produce the food and the truck drivers and the grocery store clerk and everybody that contributed. Um, Sophia, who grew up in poverty in Los Angeles, talked about her mother's little garden in the back where she grew plants and she tenderly would caress them. And she knew how, you know, the um, Sophia as a little girl would compost and she would pick mustard greens. So we're talking about these, these cultural values, ways of being that have positive outcomes for the environment, but they're not, they're not called environmentalism, either by, by the people who are engaging these practices or by outside observers. Um, they're just kind of an inherited way of being that's passed on and it's a cultural value that's uplifted. So I wanna clarify, I'm not suggesting that all Latinx communities are closer to the earth or that everybody is modeling these ideal environmental behaviors. But what I'm talking about here is a different framework for thinking about Catholic relationships with the environment um, that, are, that take place outside of the white racial frame. And so now finally getting back to your question, Stephanie, about what's um, motivating these lifestyles, it's, it's the sense of longevity, the way it's like, these are the, the ways we've always done it. When we talk about a desire to go green, that comes from environmentalism's white racial frame. The sense that you need to go green means that you haven't been green in the past. So the expressions I'm calling abuelita environmentalism come from this way of viewing and relating to nature outside of the white racial frame um, that, that derives from a sense of this is the way things have always been done and this is the way they should be done. Thank you.
Teresia, did you have any examples um, you wanted to add from your work with African religious history and expression about how uh, women or people in general might be living more what we would call sustainably, um, but it's not necessarily being motivated by a direct environmentalism? Uh, thank you very much. I forgot to say thank you for offering this wonderful opportunity for us to have this great conversation. Uh, if you may allow me, I have like three slides uh, that might allow us to have a visual of what we are talking about here. And yes, um, I like the whole idea of grandmother theology. Uh, the word for grandmother in my language is shosho. And my mother is grandmother par excellence. She was an environmentalist. Um, she protected trees, one uh, the, in the colonial understanding of land tenure. Uh, if, if something is um, next to your fence, it dare, it, it, you, you dare not have that tree overgrowing the fence into the other, uh, into the other, into your shamba, as we call them. And at one point, there is this neighbor who is like, if this avocado tree is overhanging my, my, my side of the fence, can you please cut it? And my mother was said, no. My mother said, no, I cannot cut down a food tree. Uh, don't ask me to do that. If you want, harvest from uh, your side of the fence. I wouldn't have any problems with that. And that, is, that was her approach towards uh, trees, towards her animals. Uh, she raised a lot of animals, but you are not going to have roast chicken any time soon. Uh, they're just like, you know, um, uh, her companions, so to speak. So I've learned a lot from her in particular, but also she's reflecting uh, an unnamed um, ecofeminism as a woman, uh, uh, this whole connection between protecting nature and protecting the rights of women is what we call ecofeminism, which brings me back to the whole idea of what is feminism. What, uh, when, when we talk about feminism, we are having a feminist conversation right now. What exactly do we mean? For most people, uh, for many people, when I ask them about feminism, I see them say, oh, it's about equality. Uh, between men and women, and I'm like, uh, well, uh, there is a, a, a little problem in that because you can be, uh, equality does not bring fairness. Sometimes uh, uh, when we treat, uh, be, uh, when we, uh, uh, I don't know whether you can see my slides. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Yeah, uh, as you can see in this slide, um, equality does not solve things. Uh, it doesn't solve things for the person in the wheelchair when everybody is getting a box to uh, the same size of box to stand on. He can't even stand to begin with. So the push towards equity rather than just equality uh, would be for me the goal of uh, feminism. Um, feminism also for me is, uh, is about the whole idea that women are people. Uh, and the problem, as Sharon might testify, as others might testify, is that women in many instances are treated as if they are not people. They are treated as uh, objects, as beings, as uh, uh, the, what I call the deification of women. And we can think of many examples. They are treated as beasts of burden. Uh, in, in, in domestic households, they are treated as machines to clean after us. And uh, at times they are treated as sex objects, even within our own, um, within our own homesteads. And it's, it's a silent, uh, killer for, for many women. There are all manner of stories in Kenya about women who have gone to the Middle East to act as nannies and so forth. They come home in caskets. 
have the bleed converted into something more than uh, a baby a, a baby caregiver. So women are people. If we can get that right and treat them as people, then we will be truly uh, 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 feminists. As you can see here in this slide, women are being treated as beasts of burden. They are the carriers of water, the carriers of wood. Um, and I have done these numbers. Sometimes when I see these kinds of pictures, my back begins to hurt because I used to carry water like this as a girl child. Women are people. Modern day slavery is, I think, a part of that whole problem. Uh, is, is feminism about men versus women? Uh, I think the answer to that is no. It's not, it's mis, mis, misdefined as sex war. It's not about a fight between men and women. In fact, it is a fight between all of people of, of all concerned people with an injustice or, uh, or even more accurately intersecting injustices, sexism, racism, and uh, colonialism in my case. And uh, to fight those injustices, uh, as Wangari Madai says, let us look at the anatomy that matters right now from the head up you don't need to be a certain a woman or a man to fight the injustices of race, the injustices of um, ecological racism, and so forth and so on. Uh, you asked me to reflect on, or rather the, the mention was made about women are not just victims of all these isms and ocracies, as somebody once put it. Isms are a problem. Even feminism can be a problem. Uh, and, and so in my uh, presentation, I'd like to highlight that women are people in that they have agency. They have moral agency. They are not just sitting there waiting to come and be saved from a knight in shining armor. Uh, and so uh, they... Uh, are active uh, in trying to find solutions to this common uh, crisis. And in this case, my best example from my context is that of Wangari Madai. How many of us have ever heard of her? Professor Wangari Madai? I don't know whether uh, anybody has ever heard of, uh, uh, of her uh, when, when she first died, when she died in 20, 11, I tried to alert my, my colleagues that she, an important person has passed on and they're like, Wangari, who? Who is that? This is a woman who the world recognized in 2004 for her work in uh, reforestation. Uh, the, she got the Peace, Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. In 2011, people she still didn't know of who she was. And, and they, they, they were worried that the, 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 peace, the, the, peace, uh, the peace group had lost it. How do you go giving peace prices? Theresia, could you just go to the next slide for us, please? Uh, to, to Perfect, the, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so um, she got the Nobel Peace Prize. She passed on in 20... Uh, 11, and I lift her up as an example, not only of a, a, a woman who is self-driven and uh, looking for a solution, but also somebody who, uh, who planted more than trees. She planted confidence in women so that they can fight for their own rights. And in this case, they fight, fight for the environment as well. I have slides, the slide here is uh, entitled Wagari Madai and the Wrong Bar Syndrome. She laments in this book, The Challenge of Africa, that when Africans lost that indigenous perspective, they, it's as if they got on the wrong bus and they'll never get to flourishing. Uh, the destination will, will not be arrived. So she recommends that we, re, uh, we go back to those indigenous alternative ways of living and being in the world, if we are going to not only replenish the earth, but also 
find spiritual values for healing ourselves and the world. I'll leave it there and, uh, and hopefully um, we can uh, have comments and co conversation around those initial kind of conversation starter, conversation starters. I, I don't have the half time. One of the things that was said earlier is that we get overwhelmed. It is just with too much stuff going on around us. Are we going to recycle? Are we going to uh, go and uh, clean up the river? What are we going to do uh, to amend things? And Wangare addresses that sense of being overwhelmed. Uh, and she says, we need to, she gives the story of the hummingbird. I don't know that you have ever heard of that story. She borrowed it from Japan of the, the, there was a wildfire going in the forest and everybody was so scared, the elephant, everybody was cowering in a corner, except this little hummingbird who decided to do something about it. It was going to the pod and getting a drop of water, putting out on the fire. And the other animals were like, don't be ridiculous. You have a small beak, a drop of water, when I, you know, and she's like, you're actually wasting my time. I have work to do here. I'm doing the best I can. And so Wangare Madai says, I'll be a hummingbird and I'll do the best I can with whatever little beak that I have. And so that's a thought that I find inspiring and provocative. And I would like to, um, uh, to share that with you. I would have shared it, the actual little story, it's online, but we don't have time for that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you for highlighting so specifically that while, yes, women disproportionately fall victim to climate change and environmental degradation, we also have real moral agency as part of being made in the image and likeness of God. We are moral agents um, and that often gets dismissed or truncated when women aren't allowed to be present in these conversations. Um, what would happen if the Catholic Church affirmed unequivocally that women are equal and are equally empowered to answer their calls to leadership, ordination, and ministry? How might that impact ecological justice? So, Teresia, or if someone else wants to, to jump in um, yeah. and respond to that as well is fine. I would say that would be a a step in the right direction, but declarations, you need to go beyond declarations mm -hmm. to actual practice. And the, 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 the space is there. Uh, let me go away from the church for a moment. In Kenya, uh, at the, the push of uh, women pointing out that they are excluded from politics, Finally, 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 like five years ago, uh, the Kenya government uh, decided that yes, they have a women have a point, and so we are going to reserve thirty percent of the the positions in parliament and and so forth for women. Of course, it's not fifty percent; it should be fifty percent. But at this point, you can say thirty percent is better than zero percent. And we don't get to hear about that kind of intentional action on the side of the chat. We don't even have 0 0.01 uh, of intentional saying there might not be a priest here for the longest time, but at least there'll be two women doing, uh, doing, uh, doing what they already do because they run masses, except Eucharist and so forth and so on. And so I would, I would suggest that they start challenge the church to follow, to put their actions where their words are and actually implement some of those declarations. And that would make a difference because the women will bring their, those values, uh, ecological uh, concern. They are, already, they, are, they are already motivated. They are the ones who have to feed uh, the children, they, they are the ones who have to deal with a crying child throughout the night because they are hungry. And uh, um, 
uh, we can see to be, we can begin to see uh, that happening in the work of Wangari Madai. Uh, the women, the Green Belt movement, is not just let's salvage the environment. It's about let's make uh, women and their children's lives much more livable, much more sustainable. So they can eat, they can breathe clean air. There is going to be water rather than uh, drought. And, and so that would be my position. And then again, to reiterate that indigenous, uh, as uh, was pointed out about, about the, Latina, uh, the, the Latina women, the grandmother theology, indigenous theologies, uh, including mine, I have a whole essay called the Koyo Theology of Land. Uh, and how it it is it leads to sustainability. Seen Rosemary Ruda's Women Healing Earth. That's where where I have that essay. Um, I celebrate those indigenous sensibilities that allow, for example, the uh, the indigenous people of this country to push back when the pipeline is. They say the pipeline should go all the way from Canada through their territory and people don't quite understand that standoff uh, in studying rock uh, that uh, the, 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 this is not just selfish indigenous people wanting to preserve their territory as Wangari Madai says when we do not take sustainable action we are literally digging our own graves even for selfish reasons uh, let's at least <laughs> Thank you. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, so before we move to audience questions, I'd like to ask one final question and have you each respond uh, briefly. Maybe we can start with Sharon. I see you're uh, chatting uh, some additional comments here. So um, the question I have for each of you is, what does the institutional church miss when the voices of women and other people who are marginalized are systematically excluded from conversations about climate change, environmental disaster, and eco-justice. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I think the answer is really implicit in the question. Uh, to me, there's a real hollowness and a real paucity in the church's uh, theologizing, whether it be on creation or the church's theology of the body. And that's why my comment in the chat, it was also um, in response to what Theresia was saying, that I genuinely believe that, you know, the, the conversion of hearts needs to happen internally within the church and that dismantling male clericalism um, is, is synonymous, you know, with uh, how we need to decenter the human in creation. And, and in my own work, when I turn to the spiritualities of um, others, so looking outside of the uh, Christian framework, um, there's, so, there's so much more um, rejuvenating uh, resources. So it's a shame because, uh, you know, even within the Catholic tradition, Christian tradition, we ought to, to find such um, sources for renewal. But um, yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted to say. And, and you know, we, it's, it's not just about paying lip service. To, to insisting on relationality, mutuality, and gender justice, when you know the church still extols the virtues of um, a hierarchical um, order of creation and all of that. So it's, it's becoming so stale and, and this whole exercise towards synodality, I, I'm you know, fairly skeptical as to what the outcome of that might be if, if you know, everything else regarding the how, how old is that 2000 year old theology of the church is still going to be intact. So um, that's, that's uh, what I want to say, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Chanel, did you wanna respond? Sure, uh, thank you for this important question, Stephanie. I think the short answer is everything. We miss and we lose everything and the stakes are very, very high. Um, 
when we center women's experiences, we really do have the opportunity to, to recover subjugated forms of knowledge, to have a renewed understanding of activism, especially on the local level, and to, I think, kind of retrieve practices of intergenerational care. I really appreciate Teresia's uh, commenting on indigenous forms of knowing um, and ancestral wisdom. And I'm thinking about the Yoruba religion of Ifa and how nature is often the abode of the divinities of the Orishas. The river is the abode of Oshun, the uh, divine feminine. And so there's all of this language that we can glean when we engage uh, marginalized ways of knowing, but also indigenous and ancestral traditions as well. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, my short answer would be a whole, what we lose is a whole generation of leaders. Um, at the beginning, Kate mentioned the racist and sexist history of environmentalism, and I'd like to add the colonialist history. Um, and when we're tapping into that, um, equating kind of white environmentalism as the only way of being, you know, the only type of Catholic environmentalism, the only way of responding, it's very disempowering uh, to, to people who've been excluded from that history. Um, and so there's a couple of, of, of ways that that ends up kind of silencing people. Number one is, oh, I'm not white, this isn't my problem. I didn't cause the problem. I'm not part of the solution. It's, it's up to experts. It's, it's very disempowering. It's, it's, it's just not for me. And the, the second thing is saying that, oh, okay, well, that, that's the ideal way of doing things. So uh, I, I'm not, you know, I, I can't do that. I'm not in a position to do that. And I, there's a, a really fabulous group here in LA um, through the um, Pastoral Ju Juvenil, the Spanish language ministry for young adults. And they have this faith and ecology program and, and they are having these ideals kind of through a white racial frame of what environmentalism ought to look like. And they just tell me, oh, I'm at the very beginning. I barely do anything because they're looking in, in, in these other places for what the authorities are. Um, and, and lifting up the voices of women in marginalized communities is empowering to them too, even, even the young men, because when they can see, oh, my abuela has these traditions that I can hear, that I can draw from, oh, my community has already been doing this for a long time. Um, and, and, and there's a sense of empowerment in that, like when, when people tell me like the Tupperware thing, right? Like you stupid white environmentalist, why are you buying, you know, your eco-friendly glass Tupperware? Why don't you just use what's already there, right? It's, it's, it's empowering to recognize that, that there is authority and agency in a lot of places besides among white men. Thank you. Teresia, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, let me start by apologizing. I lost, I lost you because I lost the com uh, energy in the computer. Um, but and so, uh, what's the question on the table? Can you repeat the question? What does the church miss when the voices of women are excluded from these conversations about eco justice? Yes, they, they miss a lot. They miss. Uh, as uh, was it Chanel I was just talking about the uh, uh, the situation among the Yoruba. Uh, one of the books that I use in my class is about, it's called Male Daughters and Female Husbands. Uh, this this the Igbo community have found ways of dealing with those hierarchies, neutralizing them to a certain extent, such that uh, if a, if a family has only daughters. There is no crisis because uh, those daughters, granted, of course, they are kind of going to be converted into males uh, for these purposes. Uh, women's agency is practical agency. They they do stuff. They they are not just talk talk. You know, the stereotype is that women are just talkers, not doers, but they do. And in the in the in the context of the Yoruba, to give another example than the, the Kikuyu, uh, those uh, divinities that she was talking about, some of them are female divinities. Think of Mary in the Catholic tradition, and women love Mary; uh, she's a role model for them. And one of the divinities among the Igbo is. Uh, 
has is alleged to have give, gifted women the port of prosperity. And so the economic, and you see a woman uh, driving economically and so forth, she goes to the market and she's coming back with the profit. They say, aha, the gods, the god of prosperity is smiling in her. And so that sense that uh, of, of uh, economic uh, in, uh, investment, economic uh, and invest social investment, uh, the mothering nature of, of, of women, how uh, being mothers, not just in the spiritual sense, but also literally mothering in, in, the, in, in the church. We lose that when we marginalize women and we, we silence them. Uh, she was a parent that talked about women being the silenced, not the silent, they talk, but nobody listens. The silenced majority. We lose their voice and action. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for everything you've shared so far. We are going to switch to some audience questions quickly um, before we have to wrap up. So. Uh, a few of you have kind of touched on this saying like lip service isn't enough, declarations aren't enough. Um, and so the question is last weekend, Pope Francis announced a reorganization of the Roman Curia that will allow lay people, including women, to hold positions that were previously available only to ordained men. Does this change anything? What kind of realistic impact can we expect from this and on what sort of timeline? Anyone wants to take a stab? Well, as a positive thought, assuming it to be taken from thought to action, but I also think we should be aware of one of the issues that feminists have always talked about the question of tokenism. Uh, who gets to, to be chosen under what terms for whose benefit? We need to push that question all the time. Otherwise, you just they will be just saying, oh, uh, stop complaining. We have two women from Congo. And so don't talk about women from Kenya. We have three. You can make four if you want, but that's about all. That's, that's a problem of tokenism. So we, we may need to push for action that is truly inclusive. There's also the problem of excluding by including. I don't know whether that makes sense to you. You are included just to be, to blend with everything else so that you are, you, are not, you are not standing out in the crowd. So that problem is also there, that women might be sucked into these institutional uh, systems only to be uh, silenced, not to be listened. So they, they're included, yes, but they are still excluded. That's my thought. And, uh, Thank you. I see our other panelists nodding along with uh, what you've said there. Thank you. It, it's hopeful, but that's very important to um, realize women, and it's our fault, we will act like the token rather than taking charge. So we need to take charge. Mm -hmm. We have another uh, audience question before we have to wrap up here. Um, and Chanel, maybe you would want to speak to this um, regarding the synod process that is going on right now. Um, do you see this as an opportunity for deep transformation within the institutional church that truly centers the voices of the marginalized? I think that the synodal process should um, invite us to have hope again. It really is an opportunity for the church to assume a posture of listening from the ground up 
And so I think that wherever you can find a space to attend a listening session or have your voice heard, take this opportunity to contribute in this way. Um, the ecological crisis, um, as daunting as a catastrophe as it is, it really does invite multiple voices to intervene, even from outside of the church. And so I think that synodality will hopefully open us up to that possibility. But I uh, look forward to hearing what other panelists have to say on this topic as well. Sharon, did you want to respond to that question maybe? Um, I know the pr probably the way the Senate is being actually um, you know, put into effect here in the US versus in Malaysia is probably looks a little different um, there is a um, survey that's going around, and I think um, perhaps many of us have fulfilled that, so it's uh, at the global or international level. But I'm just looking at the uh, chats, and I think Mary Hans and Louis Gutierrez's, um, uh, you know, reservation, shall we say, or uh, my own, my own take, or my own skepticism. I, I don't know. I'm still. Um, Every time I, I hear the word, you know, feminine genius and, and the, the later encyclical Fratelli Tutti where, where you know, gender ideologies, uh, you know, pervade the, the, um, the encyclical and it's only a glimpse in La Dato Cis, but, but, you know, it's, it's so in your face in the later encyclical and, and that's so hugely, um, so hugely problematic because, you know, it, it, um, continues to sideline and, and, and in a way that's really cruel. Um, LGBT identifying persons, for instance, LGBT identifying Catholics. Um, and there's, there's just so much of a structural violence that is in place. And until uh, the church actually takes stock of that, I, I think, uh, you know, synodality is, is really um, uh, just, just a compensation for, for um, you know, not for the churches, uh, for the church not holding itself um, adequately accountable. Um, these structures are, are violent because these are structures of oppression and they need to be dismantled. And, and uh, you know, thank you in that regard uh, for the work that the organization is doing, the Women's, organization, women's Ordination Conference, um, even to speak of, uh, you know, women's ordination um, as Catholic within within the Catholic fora is, is, is actually liberating. Yeah. Thank you. One last question, I think, um, before we, I hand it back over to Kate, um, for any of you who feel um, you, you'd like to respond, how could the church specifically or the environmental movement in general better center women and other people who are marginalized or more at risk for ecological disaster? I'll give a shout out to an organization in Chicago that I studied for my first book called Faith in Place. Um, and they have done amazing work uh, diversifying the environmental movement. And they do it by um, going to communities and listening. Um, and finding out what the issues are that are important to that community and finding ways that that relates um, to environmental issues. So when I was doing research there, it's been a while now, um, but when they were just beginning with these efforts, um, Veronica Kyle did African-American outreach and she went just for a year and just had meetings with pastors and found out what was going on and you know, community members what's going on and, and found that the, you know, the biggest concerns were jobs and health. And so she developed programming on healthy organic local food and green jobs, you know, bringing lots of programming and opportunities there. Um, and they've, they've done really important work in um, Latinx communities since, since I've been there. Um, and, and they have these great, there's like a storytelling program that they're doing where they're looking at the migration of butterflies and tying that to human migration stories. Um, so that's very different from, I've, I've met with people here um, who have worked with the Sierra Club and trying to do outreach in, in Latin American, Latinx communities. And what they do is they take their model that they've already done for you know, 150 years and they apply it to this community, right? 
And, and I think the way that Faith in Place has been doing it offers a really, really good example on how to kind of start from the ground up and meet people where they are and, and have, you know, include people with a real stake in the game and let them and their interests and concerns guide the process. Thank you. Yeah, I think Faith in Place um, here in Chicago is a division of Interfaith Power and Light, um, which is active in most states and also has a national presence here in the U.S. So um, yeah. if you're not familiar with them, check them out. They actually, so they were the Illinois chapter, but they've just combined with um, what Hoosier in Wisconsin. I, anyway, oh, they're, I they're representing right. now two, they're representing three states. So yeah, really, really great work. I get a mailing from them virtually every two minutes. The, uh, I was going to say what the, Amanda just described is reminds me of a whole movement in terms of um, methodological approach to helping those impacted by poverty and so forth. They call it community-based asset mapping. Uh, you 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 um, go to the community, listen first of all what 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 are the issues. You you can't decide what the issues are from outside. You go and li listen to them. They will tell you where the shoe pinches. Not only will they tell you where the shoe pinches, they will also tell you what they're doing about that shoe pinch. And therefore you build on what they are already doing rather than just saying, you know, okay, now I'm you are, you are savior. I'm coming to save you from pinching shoes and so forth. So it's called community-based asset mapping based in Chicago. Uh, Northwestern University until recently. Now I think they are based in DePaul uh, University. I find that very encouraging and I've tried to do that in my field work on food. I'm doing, uh, conducting food uh, research on hunger in my community back home. And instead of just trying to say, this is how we are going to solve your hunger, I want to find out exactly why are they hungry in their point of view. And if, because if you diagnose well, then you can treat well. And I find them, they're hungry, not because they are lazy, but because they don't have land to, to, uh, to grow their food. Um, much of the land in Kiambu, central Kenya, was taken up by the settlers. It's under coffee and tea. And so there is little land for food. So how do we solve that uh, with the people and uh, with ideas that are not going to overwhelm them even, even further? Uh, I haven't got an answer yet, but I'm probing and uh, having that whole community base. What are they doing right, right now that we can build on in finding solutions? Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists um, for your work and for your voices and sharing your expertise with us today. And again, thank you to the Women's Ordination Conference for providing a space for this conversation. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. I really look forward to continuing these conversations in other spaces. Um, we are just about at our time limit for today. So I'm going to hand it back over to Kate. Thank you all. Thank you to our amazing speakers and Stephanie for moderating this conversation. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, it's really been a gift for WALK um, and to all of us here. And before we close, I just wanna say that today is a special day for the Women's Ordination Conference and our supporters. Today is um, the World Day of Prayer for Women's Ordination, which is observed on the Feast of the Annunciation. It's a day that we honor Mary's yes to God, to God, to bear Christ for the world and to celebrate the women who courageously say, yes, I am called to priestly ministry. So our speakers have demonstrated beautifully all the ways that women are leading the way in creating and charting creative solutions to the climate crisis. And in the same way, women's prophetic leadership is leading the way to creating a much needed change within church structures. This year, as we pray for women's ordination, we also recognize its deep connection to the care for creation. So I'd like to pass, um, pass the mic over to my colleague, Katie, who will close our session today with a short prayer that she's written for us. Thank you, Kate. And just to echo the thanks to all our panelists and moderator. 
I invite you as we pray to uh, notice where you are to maybe put your feet flat on the ground and just be present in your space because um, so much of what we talk about with, with climate justice and gender justice is about knowing where you are and recognizing the sacredness where you are. And so we pray. Loving creator, you call forth the gifts of the natural world in their wondrous, startling diversity. You call forth the gifts of all genders to serve as priests to your people. For too long, we have allowed the sin of patriarchy to wreak havoc on your creation and your people and witnessed the harm of systems that name creation as lesser than people and some people as lesser than others. Jesus, born through the empowered yes of Mary, give us the courage born of love to reject anything that denies God's caress in all creation and God's image in every person. Holy Spirit, you empower women with your fierce creativity to save our church, to save our earth. May we boldly recognize and ordain their leadership and their priesthood. As co-creators with you, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Katie, and thank you all for being with us today. It was such a such a joy, um, and I especially thank all of our panelists for sharing their wisdom with us. It was incredible.